All right, Lamentations chapter 1. I'm going to read this whole thing. That's going to add quite a bit of time to our time together, but let's read this um, together. Over the last few weeks, uh, we've been sort of building on the idea of what the lament is. Um, I felt that would be appropriate um, before we actually move into um, the actual book of Lamentations. So today we're finally there. So let's read this together. How lonely sits the city that was full of people. How like a widow has she become, she who was great among the nations, she who was a princess among the provinces, has become a slave. She weeps bitterly in the night with tears on her cheeks among all her lovers. She has none to comfort her. All her friends have dealt treacherously with her, and they have become her enemies. Judah has gone into exile because of affliction and hard servitude. She dwells now among the nations, but finds no resting place. Her pursuers have all overtaken her in the midst of her distress. The roads to Zion mourn, for none come to the festival. All her gates are desolate, her priests groan, her virgins have been afflicted, and she herself suffers bitterly. Her foes have become the head, her enemies prosper, because the Lord has afflicted her for the multitude of her transgressions. Her children have gone away, captives before the foe. From the daughter of Zion, all her majesty has departed. Her princes have become like deer that find no pasture. They fled without strength before the pursuer. Jerusalem remembers in the days of her affliction and wandering all the precious things that were hers from days of old. When her people fell into the hand of the foe and there was none to help her, her foes gloated over her. They mocked at her downfall. Jerusalem sinned grievously. Therefore, she became filthy. All who honored her despise her, for they have seen her nakedness. She herself groans and turns her face away. Her uncleanness was in her skirts. She took no thought of her future. Therefore, her fall is terrible. She has no comforter. O Lord, behold my affliction, for the enemy has triumphed. The enemy has stretched out his hands over all her precious things, for she has seen the nations enter her sanctuary, those whom you forbade to enter your congregation." All our people groan as they search for bread. They trade their treasures for food <clears throat> to revive their strength. Look, O Lord, and see, for I am despised. It is nothing to you, all you who pass by. Look and see if there is any sorrow like my sorrow, which was brought upon me, which the Lord affl- inflicted on the day of his fierce anger. From on high he sent fire into my bones. He made it descend. He spread a net for my feet. He turned me back. He has left me stunned faint all the day long. My transgressions were bound into a yoke. By his hand they were fastened together. They were set upon my neck. He caused my strength to fail. The Lord gave me into the hands of those whom I cannot withstand. The Lord rejected all my mighty men in my midst. He summoned an assembly against me to crush my young men. The Lord has trodden as in a winepress the virgin daughter of Judah. For these things I weep. My eyes flow with tears for a comforter is far from me, one to revive my spirit. My children are desolate, for the enemy has prevailed. Zion stretches out her hands, but there is none to comfort her. The Lord has commanded against Jacob that his neighbor should be his foes. Jerusalem has become a filthy thing among them. The Lord is in the right, for I have rebelled against his word. But hear all you peoples and see my suffering. My young women and my young men have gone into captivity." I called to my lovers, but they deceived me. My priests and elders perished in the city while they sought food to revive their strength. Look, O Lord, for I am in distress. My stomach churns. My heart is wrung within me because I have been very rebellious. In the street, the sword bereaves. In the house, it is like death. They heard my groaning, yet there is no one to comfort me. All my enemies have heard of my trouble. They are glad that you have done it. You have brought the day you announced. Now let them be as I am. Verse 22. Let all their evil doing come before you and deal with them as you have dealt with me because of all my transgressions. For my groans are many and my heart is faint. There's something about reading God's word and there's something about hearing God's word. And so I think it's important that we share in this time together and that we uh, both hear and read it um, together. So as I mentioned, uh, over the last few weeks, we've been looking at the character of lament, uh, the purpose of lament, the usefulness of lament, 
And today we're finally in chapter one. And so we looked briefly at the context of this book throughout our first weeks together. Um, but I just want to give you a quick reminder of the context so that we can continue to build our understanding of what's happening. Uh, Lamentations describes in excruciating detail uh, the grief and the sorrow that resulted from the siege and the eventual collapse of Jerusalem in 586 B.C. And so to continue to build that context, God's people had endured five disasters, uh, one on top of another. The first was that enemies had laid siege to the city. Uh, Their shelter and comfort was taken from them. Uh, They were left desolate without water or food. And so the second sort of disaster was that the people then starved. Uh, In a rather horrific way, we read about the reality um, of surviving in a besieged city um, that you probably would never want to experience. And there's just graphic detail that we will see both in this chapter and the following chapters of what that actually looked like. So the enemies laid siege. The people starved. The next is that the city fell. The walls that kept the people safe from their enemies, they were breached, and the security of these people were taken away. The next thing was that the city was then occupied. So the fall of the city meant the end of that siege, but it also meant the beginning of God's people of finding themselves under the heel of a brutal enemy who enslaved their people. And then we also see, which is actually really important, and we'll talk about that briefly today, is that the temple was destroyed. Uh, The place where God had promised his presence was gone, uh, which would then probably ultimately, with all of these disasters, lead to this pressing question. And maybe you have asked this question at some point in your life as well. Where then is God in all of this? Many people died. Uh, In these awful days, uh, many were taken into exile as well. And Lamentations is the cry of the few who remained. And Jeremiah is the spokesperson. As I mentioned in our overview, Jeremiah is the one officiating this funeral of sorts of Jerusalem. Uh, And those who survived had to find a way to survive in the ruins of their fallen city. Lamentations is a book that is a cry from the depths of pain and sorrow and loss. It's the lament of Jeremiah, but also of all of the, of all the survivors. This is grief in all of its complexity. If I had to give today a theme, and I'll try to do this as we move forward in this book, the theme for today in chapter one would be grief. And we see the weight of that grief. Uh, pressing down on these afflicted people. And with all of its confusion and despair occupying their troubled minds, more than any book of the Bible, Lamentations speaks to those who are walking through incredible grief. It gives words to what we might feel. Now, as we walk through these five chapters, you'll notice that they're rather repetitive. And it's actually really a great picture of the character of grief, isn't it? Uh, As we are all aware, grief is not uh, linear. It's not A, B, C, D, even though people like to make it that way. Uh, Grief is rather messy. Uh, Those who have experienced tremendous grief, they know what it is like to go over and over what has happened again and again. There's moments that remind you of your grief, and you just get taken right back to that place. There's moments that happen that uh, remind you of the comfort that you found in your grief, and you go back to that over and over and over again. But grief is the process of adapting to the loss of something or someone that we loved. And those who experience loss are often referred to as the bereaved. And we, see, we saw that in the text as well. If you actually look at the definition of the word reaved, it means to rob or to plunder or to tear away. Uh, so the bereaved, those who are grieving, feel like they have had something or someone taken away from them. 
They feel as if they are being torn in two. And all of us will walk through the valley of grief and loss at different times, in different intensities, and in different ways. And Lamentations addresses this issue head on. Now, uh, this first chapter, uh, honestly, the entire book, uh, references weeping and groaning and grief and tears. In verse 2, speaking of Jerusalem, uh, Jeremiah says she weeps bitterly in the night with tears on her cheeks. Verse 8, she herself groans and turns her face away. Verse 11, all her people groan as they search for bread. Verse 16, for these things I weep, my eyes flow with tears. Verse 21, they heard my groaning, yet there is no one to comfort me. Verse 22, for my groans are many, and my heart is faint. Jeremiah is not only speaking from his own grief, but he is speaking on behalf of all of those who are weeping and grieving and in their tears. And so Jeremiah does this in a rather interesting way. Um, because as we travel through these five chapters, uh, Jeremiah does something really interesting that he personifies Jerusalem as though it were a person. And so we see from verse one that this person is a female. How lonely sits the city that was full of people. How like a widow has she become. And so let's affectionately refer to Jerusalem moving forward as Lady Jerusalem. So Jeremiah uh, refers to Lady Jerusalem to personify the, the nation of Jerusalem. And what he will teach us in this first chapter is he will recall this tale of destruction. And what this re recollection of this destruction does is it actually reveals the extent of man's depravity. Uh, we see a grief-stricken land and a grief-stricken people. They are bewildered and baffled and living in agony, and they are pained. And we see this quite vividly in verse 1 through 3. We sense the shock and the horror and how things were turned upside down. This is a dramatic reversal of fortune. Uh, it says the city was full. Now it's lonely. That the city was great among the nations. Now it's like a widow and a slave. The city weeps and now has no one to bring comfort. Which is a really interesting point to land on really quickly because this idea of no one to comfort is actually repeated five times throughout this first chapter. And the repetition is very deliberate. Uh, but I just want to make note of that. So kind of tuck that away. And, and we'll, we'll visit that often as we walk through these five chapters. But additionally, um, I don't know about you, but what jumped out to me is uh, the reference of Jerusalem as a widow. And then in verse 2 mentions that her lovers don't even comfort her. That's interesting to me. Uh, a widow would suggest that her husband is dead. But notice that she is actually described as like a widow. And that's really important. A woman who once had a husband, possibly. But mainly a woman who is alone. When we look at uh, the Old Testament, and so let's put our Old Testament hats on for a second. Um, let me ask you a question. Uh, when you consider the Old Testament, do we see a record of Israel's exclusive devotion to God? Or is the Old Testament a record of Israel worshiping other gods again and again and again? It would be the latter. The prophets repeatedly came to the people of Israel and accused them of prostituting themselves to foreign gods. Uh, warning them that God is patient, but that he would not tolerate this forever. Think of Hosea, the prophet who was told to actually marry a prostitute so that he can experience firsthand what it was like for God. 
uh, to where he would have to go and retrieve his wife, Israel, from the bed of her many lovers. So the lovers of Lady Jerusalem then are surrounding uh, and, and are the surrounding nations and their idol gods. And Lady Jerusalem is like a widow abandoned by God, her husband, because of her multiple lovers. This is the picture that is being painted here. And now she is lying in the rubble of Jerusalem with no husband. And not even her lovers are there to comfort her. There is no comfort for her. No one is seeking to soothe her sorrow. And the abandonment is only increasing the pain of her sorrow. Now, as we move forward on top of this grief, on that grief of being abandoned and alone, Jeremiah refers to another reason in verse 4 through 6 as another reason for their sorrow. And it was that the worship of God had ceased. In verse 4 through 6, we see this. Uh, the worship of the Lord, it stopped for such a long period of time because of them turning their back on the Lord that it seemed like it had become extinct. It references festivals, uh, the festivals that were once celebrated by the people of Israel had now ceased. So we see Lady Jerusalem depicted as a widow and she's also depicted as childless in verse 5. Her children have gone away captives before the foe. This is painting a picture that there is a deathly silence that hangs over Jerusalem. A silence that comes from loneliness and the lack of any companionship and no lineage. I remember a few years ago, uh, my family thought that it was an incredible idea um, because I, they thought I needed time away. They got me a hotel and kind of shipped me off uh, for one night. And they, they put like a, they, they, they said, just read your Bible, like pray, just don't watch TV. Just promise us that you won't watch TV. And so I obliged. And that was an absolutely miserable time. And so I came back and, and they said, well, how was it? I said, it was miserable. And they said, why? I said, because silence is kind of terrifying. You're just kind of stuck in your head. You're just racing back and forth. I said, just don't ever do that for me again. Because I'm, I'm not going to go. You can go and have fun. But there is a silence that Jerusalem is experiencing. And he speaks of that. Uh, in these verses. And then he continues uh, and he paints this picture of Jerusalem as desolate by mentioning its former majesty in verse 6, which has now deteriorated because of the ruin that it now lay in. Lady Jerusalem, who had once had a confident and decorated demeanor, has been stripped of her ornaments and her honor and her dignity. And her shoulders are now slumped, and her face is full of anguish. Now, if you look back at the history of Israel once again, this state was brought upon by the worship of God being neglected. To where their forgetfulness of God, their great sin, and their misdirected worship had brought them to this point. This is God's judgment on Lady Jerusalem. And we'll see that throughout the entire book. And Jeremiah laments this reality. And he articulates that this negligent behavior should be the greatest cause of grief for the people of Jerusalem. Maybe to say it a different way, the most severe consequence of them all, that the church is so scattered that God could no longer be collectively worshipped. But it gets worse. Because we see in verse 7 through 10, another cause of grief for Jerusalem, and it's ingratitude. John Calvin stated, ingratitude is like an abyss that absorbs the fullness of God's blessings. 
Jeremiah shares that when Jerusalem was living in majesty and splendor, it didn't think enough about God's blessings. They took it for granted. And it got me thinking that those who despise God still fill themselves with whatever the Lord gives because all comes from the hand of God. All is a gift of God, whether they acknowledge it or not. And they enjoy the spoil of God's provision, yet do not acknowledge him. And this is where Israel finds themselves. This is where Jerusalem is. Jerusalem has flourished for so long. And because of that flourishing, it only increased the misery of losing it when they fell into the enemy's hands. And so Jeremiah takes this even further, and he uses a, a really graphic illustration of a woman who is shamefully exposed and violated. And this is actually a direct reference to the destruction of the temple. It speaks of the precious things, which are the treasures of the temple, which were robbed and stolen and ransacked by the Babylonians. Uh, the sacred things had been profaned, and the sacred place was violated. It is a terrible thing for people to have lost all their possessions, to lose their lives, to wander in exile, to suffer great hardship, but it should be even more painful for them to see the temple desecrated and even more sorrowful that their precious things have been violated. Do you see what's happening? Jeremiah is picturing for us grief, but he's taking that grief beyond just those external circumstances that happen to us. There is a deeper grief that we should carry. There's a deeper grief that we should always remember. The depth of this grief that Jeremiah points out reveals the extent of man's depravity. But just when you thought it was over, and when you thought you didn't need any more evidence, just read verse 11 through 22, and that will scratch that itch, right? Uh, these verses are an affirmation of God's judgment. The judgment that God had warned the people about generation after generation through the prophets. And it's finally come. And the reality of this judgment is that Lady Jerusalem has nobody to blame but herself. They only had themselves to blame for this calamity. It is her sin. Their sin that brought this upon themselves. And because of that, it makes the grief that they're experiencing the worst grief that one can experience. In verse 13 through 17, we see imagery of the siege of Jerusalem, speaking of fire and nets and prisoners being chained together, failing strength, trampled people, desolate children, again, acknowledging that it was the Lord who brought this judgment. And then that leads to a confession but it's important to note that there is not an ask for forgiveness or deliverance or rescue. It's a confession. Maybe you can call it an intercession, but honestly, I don't even think those are the right words for it. I would say it's more of a warning. Verse 18, Lady Jerusalem depicted here, Jeremiah says, see my suffering. This is a call to look and to learn from what has happened. And then the closing of this chapter reiterates the distress and the events that led to this intense grief. Again, the depth and the extent of the depravity of man is seen clearly in the experience of Lady Jerusalem. And what is even more telling is that there is an acknowledgement that this judgment is deserved. And that judgment is deserved by every nation and every individual because of the depravity of the human condition. Verse 21, you have brought the day announced. Now let them be as I am, 
Verse 22, let all their evil doing come before you and deal with them as you have dealt with me. How often do we limit our grief to external circumstance? Loss and trouble, difficulty, confusion, death, personal pain, or the pain of a loved one, just to name a few. Yet Lamentations 1 shows us a different kind of grief than we are often used to acknowledging. And it is a grief that stems from the condition of all humanity. A grief that comes from deathly silence of separation from the Lord. A grief that comes from the weight of our condition that causes us to cease our worship of God and to worship him appropriately and rightly. A grief that comes from our propensity towards ingratitude. There are realities in our lives that must be grieved. That we often fail to appropriately acknowledge because chiefly we must grieve the consequence of our sin, which is the worst grief of all. As disheartening and damaging and confusing and difficult and troubling and unbearable as your grief may be, if you, like me, can admittedly say, as verse 22 says, for my groans are many and my heart is faint. Remember that the grief that stems from our sin should be greater. For we know that ultimately our sin warrants death. Yet because of the Lord Jesus Christ and his complete work on the cross, for those whom the Father has given to the Son, we receive his abundant and sufficient mercy. And when rightful judgment comes on the whole earth, to every tribe, to every nation, and to every person. Those who are in Christ will be found righteous, not because of anything that we've done or achieved or accumulated, but solely because of the imputed righteousness of Christ given to those who have been redeemed. Lament, embracing the reality of life, grief, actually brings the gospel into greater light. It actually gives it its appropriate weight in our life. And there's another side to this. And we see this pictured for those who are not in Christ. They await a despair that is far greater than the despair that Lady Jerusalem experienced, far greater than the shame that Lady Jerusalem experienced. They experience a place of no comfort and no comforter forever. I want to close uh, by drawing your attention to a line in verse 9. So if you want to go there real quick. It says, Her unclean, unclean, uncleanness was in her skirt. She took no thought of her future. She took no thought of her future. I want you to remember that as we search and examine these laments. Because my hope and my prayer is that we would come to understand more fully the sure judgment of God that awaits us all. That we would not fall into this category of taking no thought of our future. And may we come to see the devastating effects of failing to consider our eternity and living a life ignoring the one who is both the judge and redeemer. That's what Lamentations ultimately reveals to us. So here's my encouragement to you. Grieve. grief. Yet may our grief actually be a reminder that pushes us to the cross. <clears throat> grief is appropriate and right. But may we come to realize that there's more to grieve 
than just that that we see in front of us. So, Father, I ask you that as we finish up this time today, that you would remind us of these truths, that we would be people who understand the depth of our depravity, and that we would realize that we are to grieve our sin and the consequences of it. Yet, Lord, we are thankful for the complete work of the cross, for your abundant mercy, your sufficient grace. I ask you, Lord, that you would remind us of these truths today. We love you, and we thank you, and it's in Jesus' name we pray.